Uh, how's the sound? All right? Good. Um, so, believe it or not, this is the final lecture of the Risho Ankokoram uh, to secure peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth. So it's taken us 11 lectures uh, and more than two years uh, to get through this most important work. And I think you will agree with me that on that long journey, none of it's been boring. So, uh, we've been really grappling with this thesis in considerable detail. And as you know, it was written as a result of the appalling uh, times that Japan was going through in the 13th century uh, when Nichiren Daishonin wrote this. And it clearly explains that the solution to all those problems is nothing else but through establishing the ultimate truth. And every step of the way, I think you'll agree with me, in each lecture, each paragraph of the Gosho, we became increasingly aware that the ills of Japan in the 13th century are in no way different whatsoever to the ills which the whole world is suffering from today. So the solution to the ills of the world, of course, is the same. In the end, there is no other way but for people to understand the ultimate truth. And this, of course, is our task and is achieving what we term Kosen Rufu. Kosen Rufu being the stage where there is a large number of people in this world who are no longer slandering life and who are devoting themselves to the ultimate truth or if they're not actually devoting themselves in practice they are supporting those who do. So in this respect this document called the Risho Ankokuron is pure treasure for human beings everywhere. We really have to have conviction in this ourselves. If we doubt this document then we need it to read it again and again because this document also explains in the greatest detail the validation for all that Nichiren Daishonin is saying. So for my own part I really pray that the Risho Ankokoron lives on in our lives forever and that in due course perhaps in another ten years time someone else will be giving these series of lectures and passing it on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation on into the future until the ultimate truth is actually established. I also really hope and pray that none of us will join that brigade of people who uh, because they their faith in their own religion is so weak, so weak maintain that there are many different ways to enlightenment many different paths I hope none of us here ever fall into that trap so of course it's true that there are many paths to the Gonzan but for us who have the amazing and unbelievable good fortune to have found the Gonzan ahead of most of the human race. It's important that we clearly understand to the very depths of our lives that nam myoho horenge kyo is not a path. nam myoho horenge kyo and the Gohonzon are the ultimate truth. nam myoho horenge kyo, if you like, is it. It's not a path to anywhere. And it's very important that we have absolute conviction in that. And if we don't have it, then we should go on reading the Risho Ankogoron and chanting about it until we do, because everything is explained in here. We've now reached the last of the nine answers, which, if you remember, the host, who is Nichiren Daishonin, gives to the traveler who calls on him and spends a night with him. 
the traveller representing uh, Hojo Tokiyori, the most powerful man in Japan at that time. And it was to this man, Hojo Tokiyori, that Nichiren Daishonin addressed this thesis and sent it to him on the 16th of July, 1260. So, as you will see, after this final answer by Nichiren Daishonin to the, host, to the traveller's questions, the traveller is totally convinced and he declare, uh, declares his determination to follow Nichiren Daishonin's guidance and in that way to restore peace in the land of Japan. So we'll listen now as John reads this. For those of you who've got the original study materials, it's page 30, left-hand column, halfway down. Page 30, left-hand column, halfway down. And for those of you who've got the Gosho uh, major writings of Nichiren Daishonin, it's volume 2, page 41, last paragraph. So I hope you're all on beam. The host exclaimed with delight. As the proverb said, says, the dove has changed into a hawk, the sparrow into a clam. How gratifying. You have transformed yourself through your association with me. And like the bramble growing in the hemp field, you have learned to stand up straight. If you will truly give consideration to the troubles I have been describing and put entire faith in these words of mine, then the winds will blow gently. The waves will be calm, and in no time at all will we, we will enjoy bountiful harvests. But a person's heart may change with the times, and the nature of a thing may alter with its surroundings, just as the moon in the water will be tossed about by the waves, or the soldiers in the vanguard will be cowed by the swords of the enemy. So, although at this moment you may say you believe in my words, I fear that later you will forget them completely. Now, if we wish, first of all, to bring security to the nation and to pray for our present and future lives, then we must hasten to examine and consider the situation and take measures as soon as possible to remedy it. Why do I say this? Because of the seven types of disasters described in, this passages, in the passage from the Yakushi Sutra that I, have, that I cited earlier, five have already occurred. Only two have yet to appear the calamity of invasion from foreign lands and the calamity of revolt within one's own domain. And of the three calamities mentioned in the passage of, from the Daijuku Sutra, two have already made their appearance. Only one remains, the disaster of warfare. The different types of disaster and calamity enumerated in the Konkomyo Sutra have arisen one after the other. Only that described as bandits and marauders from other regions invading and plundering the nation has yet to materialize. This is the only trouble that has not yet come. And of the seven calamities listed in the Ninno Sutra, six are now upon us in full force. Only one has not yet appeared, the calamity that occurs when enemies rise up on all four sides and invade the nation. Moreover, as the Ninno Sutra says, when a nation becomes disordered, it is the evil spirits which first show signs of rampancy. Because these spirits become rampant, all the people of the nation become disordered. Now, if we examine the present situation carefully in the light of this passage, we will see that the various spirits have for some time been rampant, and many of the people have perished. If the misfortune that the sutra predicted would come first has already occurred, as it obviously has, then how can we doubt that the later disasters will follow? If, in punishment for the evil doctrines that are upheld, the troubles that have yet to appear should fall upon us one after the other, then it will be too late to act, will it not? Emperors and kings have their foundation in the state and bring peace and order to the age. Ministers and commoners hold possession of their fields and gardens and supply the needs of the world. But if bandits come from other regions to invade the nation, or if a revolt breaks out within the domain, the, the domain and people's lands are seized and plundered, how can there be anything but terror and confusion? If the nation is destroyed and families are wiped out, then where can one flee for safety? 
if you care anything about your personal security, you should first of all pray for order and tranquility throughout the four quarters of the land, should you not? It seems to me that when people are in this world, they all fear what their lot may be in the life to come. So it is that some of them put their faith in heretical teachings or pay honor to those who slander the law. It distresses me that they should be so confused about right and wrong. And at the same time, I feel pity that, having embraced Buddhism, they should have chosen the wrong kind. With the power of faith that is in their hearts, why must they vainly give credence to heretical doctrines? If they do not shake off these delusions that they cling to, but continue to harbor false ideas, then they will quickly depart from the world of the living and fall into the hell of incessant suffering. Thus, the Daijuku Sutra says, Though the ruler of a, state, of a state may have for countless existences in the past practiced the giving of alms, observed the precepts, and abided by the principles of wisdom, if he sees that my law, the Dharma of the Buddha, is in danger of perishing and stands idly by without doing anything to protect it, then all the inestimable store of good causes that he has accumulated through the practices just mentioned will be entirely wiped out. Before long, the ruler will fall gravely ill, and after his life has come to an end, he will be reborn in one of the major hells. And the same fate will befall the ruler's consort, his heir, the great ministers of the state, the lords of cities, the village heads and generals, the magistrates of districts, and the government officials. The Nino Sutra states, if a man does injury to the teachings of the Buddha, he will have no filial sons, no harmony with his close relatives, and no aid from the heavenly deities. Disease and evil spirits will come day after day to torment him. Disasters will descend on him incessantly, and misfortunes will dog him wherever he goes. And when he dies, he will fall into one of the three realms of hell, hunger, or animality. Even if he should be reborn as a human being, he will be destined to become a slave in the army. Retribution will follow as an echo follows a sound, or a shadow follows a form. A person writing at night may put out the lamp, but the words he has written will still remain. It is the same with the destiny we create for ourselves in the threefold world. The second volume of the Lotus Sutra says, One who refuses to take faith in this sutra and instead, instead slanders it will, after he dies, fall into the hell of incessant suffering. And in the Fukyo chapter in the seventh volume it says, for a thousand aeons they dwelt in the hell of incessant suffering and underwent great pain and torment. In the Nirvana Sutra we read, If a man separates himself from good friends, refuses to listen to the true law, and instead embraces evil teachings, then as a result he will sink down into the hell of incessant suffering where he will experience indescribable torment. When we look at this wide variety of sutras, we find that they all stress how grave a matter it is to slander the law. How pitiful that all men should go out of the gate of the true law and enter so deep into the prison of these perverse dogmas. How stupid that they should fall one after the other into the snares of these evil doctrines and remain for so long entangled in this net of slanderous teachings. They lose their way in these mists and miasmas and sink down amid the raging flames of hell. How they must grieve! how they must suffer. Therefore, you must quickly reform the tenets that you hold in your heart and embrace the one true vehicle, the single good doctrine of the Lotus Sutra. If you do so, then the threefold world will all become the Buddha land. And how could a Buddha land ever decline? The regions in the ten directions will all become treasure realms. And if and how could a treasure realm ever suffer harm? If you live in a country that knows no decline or diminution, in a land that suffers no harm or disruption, then your body will find rest and security, and your mind will be calm and untroubled. You must believe my words. Heed what I say. The guest said, Since it concerns both this life and the lives to come, who could fail to be cautious in a matter such as this? Who could fail to agree with you? Now, when I examine the passengers, the passages you have cited from the sutras and see exactly what the Buddha has said, 
I realize that slandering is a very grave offense indeed, that violating the law is in truth a terrible sin. I have put all my faith in one Buddha alone, Amida, and rejected all other Buddhas. I have honored the three Pure Land Sutras and set aside the other Sutras. But this was not due to any distorted ideas of my own conception. I was simply obeying the words of the eminent men of the past. And the same is true of all the other persons in the Ten Directions who follow the Pure Land teachings. But now I realize that to do so means to exhaust one's inborn capacity in this life and to fall into the hell of incessant suffering in the life to come. The texts you have cited are perfectly clear on this point and their arguments are detailed. They leave no room for doubt. With your kind instruction to guide me, I have been able bit by bit to dispel the ignorance from my mind. Now I hope we may set about as quickly as possible taking measures to deal with these slanders against the law and to bring peace to the world without delay, ensuring that I may live in safety in this life and enjoy good fortune in the life to come. But it is not enough that I alone should accept and have faith in your words. We must see to it that others as well are warned of their errors. Thank you very much, John. So at last, as you see, uh, the guest has completely understood that the only way to rid the land uh, of its problems and troubles is to reject inferior teachings and concentrate the lives of everybody in the land on the ultimate truth. And uh, he points out in those paragraphs that of course it's the people who are led astray by the priests and monks who have been teaching those inferior sutras. Now, therefore, the only way to overcome the problem in actuality is for both the government and the people to stop making offerings to such priests and monks. Now, this is a very important point because at that time the ruling authorities were solidly sponsoring uh, such sects as Zen and Shingon and it was these sects and the priests and monks in charge of them who in turn were persuading the government to persecute Nichiren Daishonin. And in the final paragraphs which you've just heard, Nichiren Daishonin also warns that urgent steps have to be taken to stop the inferior teachings from spreading any further. Otherwise, he says, the two remaining calamities or disasters which are predicted in the earlier sutras of the Buddha, which will befall those people or countries who are slandering the law of life, will inevitably occur. And those two uh, remaining disasters, which have not yet appeared, though all the others have, are civil war and invasion by a foreign power. So in emphasizing this point, through his understanding of all the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, Nichiren Daishonin uh, was making a very important prediction. In fact, of course, the ruling authorities of those times completely ignored the Risho An Kokoron. But exactly as predicted, both these disasters of civil war and foreign invasion took place exactly as he said they would, validating in the process, of course, everything that he'd said in the Risho An Kokoron. Civil war broke out whilst Nichiren Daishonin was in exile on Sado Island after they had tried to behead him on the beach at Tatsunakuchi. And it's incredible to note that in the case of foreign invasion, uh, the first step towards it took place exactly seven years and seven months from the date on which the Risho An Kokorom was presented. That first step being the arrival of Mongol emissaries in Japan with an ultimatum. Then, amazingly enough, since Japan rejected the ultimatum, the first invasion by the Mongols 
took place exactly 14 years after the Risha An Kokoram was written. And the second invasion took place exactly 21 years after the Risha An Kokoram was written. So bearing in mind the relationship between the figure seven and the seven characters of Nam Renge Kyo and our understanding of the importance of this figure, we can see that the rhythm of life works both in great happenings and disastrous happenings. And these happenings of foreign invasion occurred and manifested themselves measured in time by multiples of seven, multiples of nam myoho So through this we can really see the rhythm of the law of life at work. So now we're going to take paragraph by paragraph, and in the usual way I'll ask John to read the first bit. The host exclaimed with delight, as the proverb says, the dove has changed into a hawk, the sparrow into a clam. How gratifying. You have transformed yourself through your association with me, and like the bramble growing in the hemp field, you have learned to stand up straight. If you will truly give consideration to the troubles I have been describing, and put entire faith in these words of mine, then the winds will blow gently, the waves will be calm, and in no time at all we will enjoy bountiful harvests. But a person's heart may change with the times, and the nature of a thing may alter with its surroundings. Just as the moon in the water will be tossed about by the waves, or the soldiers in the vanguard will be cowed by the swords of the enemy, so, although at this moment you may say you believe in my words, I fear that later you will forget them completely. You have transformed yourself through your association with me, and like the bramble growing in the hemp field, you have learnt to stand up straight. Now in this sentence, Nichiren Daishonin is emphasizing the importance to our lives of the people with whom we associate. It's a human tendency, of course, to be strongly influenced by our environment. But equally, uh, as Buddhists, we know that through the principle of Esho Funi, the inseparability of man and his environments, we too can have great influence on our environment. So Nichiren Daishonin is saying it is important that through the power of our practice we establish a good environment containing valuable friends and influences and especially, of course, the Gohonzon itself. So I guess most people today want to live happy, valuable, peaceful lives. They long in their hearts for this. But it is the environment which playing on their desires causes them to plunge down the wrong track. Not only people, but it's the same with countries. There is a chain reaction. One country following the wrong philosophy of life will cause another country, and then another country, and then another country to go the wrong way for the people's happiness. And we can see this today, of course, in the events that surround us. In the tragedies of Eastern European countries. In the way in which our own country, following the lead of the United States, is deeply involved in nuclear pr proliferation. In the way in which at this very time, Japan is under in in incredible pressure from the West to rearm to an extent that its constitution does not allow. So the whole purpose of the SGI, the Sokogakai International, is to gradually overcome people's adherence to such inferior philosophies and teachings throughout the world, to open the eyes of the people of the world to the ultimate truth, so that as people, they can unite together to stop this disastrous trend. As you know, I've just come back from Japan, where there were more than 3,000 representative overseas members present, assembled there for a World Peace Festival 
and for the third general meeting of Soka Gakkai International. And I'd like to, at this point, read a few passages from President Keda's speech to that general meeting, which are very relevant to what we're studying today. He said this, and this is just uh, a little over a week ago. On this planet of ours, there is nothing more important than life and peace and the fundamental law of life and the universe. The important question is how to maintain and preserve life through establishing peace. In this respect, we know that human beings have experienced many failures and made many mistakes. We can only overcome this inherent tendency through embracing the law of life. It is our great good fortune to, to have become enlightened to the existence of this mystic law before many others even know about it. Because we are bodhisattvas of the earth, we have been able to embrace the mystic law ahead of most of the human race. As human beings, we are deeply related to our daily environment and circumstances. In other words, man is deeply related to the society in which he lives and works. Therefore, if man is to be happy, he must change those aspects of his society which cause unhappiness. Since man's relationship with society is symbiotic, it is essential that all our actions are based on faith through Ichin and Sanzen. When we look at the stark reality of the world today, we see each single nation possessed by nationalism, racialism, and egoism. Of course, we have to accept the fact that each nation has its own laws and regulations, and these we must respect. At the same time, we can still follow our own path, the path of the mystic law. This is the most realistic path to follow in order to, to, to attain absolute happiness and spread it to others. In order to do this, it is vital that we should continue to develop an ever greater and deeper faith. Then we will ourselves be a manifestation of the mystic law. So, this great Risho Ankokuron is saying the same thing. We can become, as ordinary human beings, a manifestation of the mystic law. Hence, all our actions will be based on the wisdom and the compassion of that law. And these are bound to reflect throughout our society. So we'll elaborate on this point a bit more as we go along. I'll ask John to continue to read. Now, if we wish first of all to bring security to the nation and to pray for our present and future lives, then we must hasten to examine and consider the situation and take measures as soon as possible to remedy it. Why do I say this? Because of the seven types of disasters described in the passage from the Yakushi Sutra that I cited earlier, Five have already occurred. Only two have yet to appear. The calamity of invasion from foreign lands and the calamity of revolt within one's own domain. And of the three calamities mentioned in the passage from the Daijuku Sutra, two have already made their appearance. Only one remains, the disaster of warfare. The different types of disaster and calamity enumerated in the Konkomyo Sutra have arisen one after the other. Only that described as bandits and marauders from other regions invading and plundering the nation has yet to materialize. This is the only trouble that has not yet come. And of the seven calamities listed in the Ninno Sutra, six are now upon us in full force. Only one has not yet appeared, the calamity that occurs when enemies rise up on all four sides and invade the nation. So there can be no doubt that in one part of the world or other, people are being afflicted by the three calamities and seven disasters at this very point in time. And this, of course, is perpetuating the unhappiness of the people everywhere. 
The three calamities, as expressed in the Daijuku Sutra, are inflation, war, and pestilence. The seven disasters, as expressed in the Yakushi Sutra, are epidemics, foreign invasion, civil war, unseasonable storms, unseasonable droughts, changes in the heavens which have a deep and profound effect on nature and eclipses which have a similar effect. So Nichiren Daishonin is saying here that unless we keep moving these disasters will never abate. On the contrary, they will increase. So the only solution, of course, is Shakabuku, teaching others about the existence of the ultimate truth. Speaking generally, people are naturally very short-sighted. They can't see below the surface of the problems which beset the world today. Because they can't see below the surface, they are unable to change the root cause of these problems and thus, in the end, achieve a lasting peace and harmony. It's like a weed. Unless you get to the root, however much you cut it down, it will always grow again. So people think, for example, that disarmament is the solution to peace. But in fact, it isn't. Unless the root cause for human beings to arm themselves is removed and eradicated from this world, the three poisons lying in the depths of every human life, which cause war and all these other devilish acts which are occurring to cause people to be unhappy, will continue. Even if disarmament was achieved, inevitably, unless the root cause is eradicated, people will start to arm again. I've already mentioned the exactness in terms of time of Nichiren Daishonin's predictions of civil war and foreign evasion. <coughs> At that time, these were a cornerstone or a fundamental cause for Kosen Rufu. As a result of those predictions exactly being fulfilled of foreign invasion and civil war, they validated the wisdom and the truth contained in the Risho Ankokuron. And also, as an immediate result, they resulted in Nichiren Daishonin's ultimate pardon by the government. <coughs> Through this, he was able to retire to Mount Minobu, as you know, and there he laid the foundations for Kosen Rufu, training his disciples and inscribing the Daigo Honsen, all of which, which took place in the last eight years of his life. Okay, let's go on. Moreover, as the Nino Sutra says, when a nation becomes disordered, it is the evil spirits which, which first show signs of rampancy. Because these spirits become rampant, all the people of the nation become disordered. Now, if we examine the present situation carefully in the light of this passage, we will see that the various spirits have for some time been rampant, and many of the people have perished. If the misfortune that the Sutra predicted would come first has already occurred, as it obviously has, then how can we doubt that the later disasters will follow? If, in punishment for the evil doctrines that are upheld, the troubles that have yet to appear should fall upon us one after the other, then it will be too late to act, will it not? There Nichiren Daishonin, talking about evil spirits being rampant, is referring to inferior teachings. Inferior teachings which sap people's life force and unbalance their lives, and as a result, of course, create chaos and disorder in society itself. In the Gosho, uh, the person and the law, you all know that important passage which reads, since the law is supreme, the person is worthy of respect. Since the person is worthy of respect, 
The land is sacred. Therefore, to establish a peaceful, prosperous and happy land, the law or teaching must be supreme. I don't think in all the world there are any peaceful, prosperous and happy lands at the moment, in truth. Each and every problem in the world today can therefore be traced back to inferior teachings. What are the pillars of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism when related to human life, when these teachings of the ultimate truth actually become integrated with our daily lives? When President Ikeda was giving this lecture 14 years ago, he pointed out that they were the three principles which have been put on this placard behind me. Freedom, equality, dignity. Dignity meaning the supreme dignity of each and every individual life form, and especially, of course, of human life. So although each of these principles is separate in itself, they are all actually interdependent. For example, freedom for some cannot be at the expense of the dignity of other people's lives. Likewise, equality must be based on the dignity of each individual life. And of course, the dignity of people's lives, again, must not be at the expense of the freedom or equality of others' lives. So they're all interchangeable, but they are the unshakable three pillars of a Buddhist democracy. And I think it's worthwhile spending a little time examining each one of them. I want to take dignity first, because this rests at the base, or if you like, supports the other two. The supreme dignity of each individual person's life the main pillar of a Buddhist democracy. Of course, many people in the world talk about the dignity of life, but sadly, it's mostly pure theory. Because without the right philosophy and a practice which is powerful enough to enable one to live that philosophy, to maintain the dignity of every single individual life uh, is virtually impossible. So Jesus Christ taught, of course, the dignity of life. But the proof of the pudding, I think, is in the eating. That Christian practice has lacked the power to sustain that course. So that as a result, speaking generally, Christianity has been a history of war and violence. Today, of course, we suffer from the hangover of this. In the way the state of mind and the way of acting of many of our people. Where is the dignity of life, for example, in the vicious behavior of football fans? Where is the dignity of life in the war we waged on the Falkland Islands? Absolutely the only way the supreme dignity of life can be preserved and respected and sustained is through following a philosophy and practice which, one, uh, which enables one to reveal the highest state of human life. Without this, the devilish force of life will always win the battle. So the supreme act of dignity is for someone who is filled with the qualities of this highest state of human life to help others to reveal the same state. Shakabuku is therefore, without a shadow of doubt, the highest and most noble and pure action, the supreme act, if you like, of humanity, to express and draw out the highest state of human life from others enabling them to establish the supreme dignity of their lives with all the great qualities of Buddhahood which go with it. 
Then we go on to freedom. I think it would be fair to say that in this country today, the concept of freedom is still freedom from the dogma and the commandments and the moral code of Christianity. It is also, of course, freedom from the class system, which goes back to feudal times and became the framework within which the Christian moral code was conducted. But in fact, these two are only partial freedoms. Buddhism po points out that in the light of the law of causality, these are only comparatively shallow external freedoms because they will again not be long-lasting unless the root cause of the evils of the class system and the moral code and its attraction to people because of that root cause is removed. So what is the root cause? Again, it is inferior and incomplete religious teachings which, because of their inadequacy, had to resort to a moral code based on fear and hierarchical domination. So what is the solution to this? Bearing in mind that all phenomena and therefore our environment are in a state of constant flux, true freedom is developing the power within oneself to have freedom from influence by external conditions whether they be social, political, or religious, if they are against the supreme dignity of one's own life. And, of course, it is finding freedom in the battle within oneself, which means freedom from control by one's shallow desires, or, if you like to put it that way, the dark side of life. Freedom from the chains of our unhappy karma, and freedom from the sufferings of life. And this inner transformation can only be attained which, by a religion which has the power to bring out the highest state of human life. And then equality. Equality, of course, is also preached in Christianity. All human beings are stated to be equal before God and indeed born in his image. But the question is, does God appear to create human beings equally? Despite that, uh, politics, economics, uh, philosophy and so on have traditionally preached equal rights for everybody. But in fact, we know quite well this has proved to be pure theory throughout history. Buddhism points out the truth that in fact, of course, everyone is different. There are great inequalities because of karma. People's natures too are different. Everyone has different abilities and a different potential. It's not surprising, therefore, that although it is supposed to be based on Christian ethics, Western democracy has emphasized freedom far more than the difficult problem of equality. Wherever we look, we see inequality. Employers, employees, rich against poor, racial problems and so on. In nearly every field of society, there are acute inequalities. And as a result, we see frustration and anger, riots and wars. But even despite all that, we are still not equal. If we look on the other side of the sociological scene, we see communism, which has found itself to be emphasizing equality rather than freedom. Equality, that is to say, in material well-being. However, the truth of the matter is that to impose this principle of equality on people 
who are innately different has resulted in a rigid and restrictive system, social system, which in turn has restricted people's freedom. As a result, we see the same as on the other side of the coin, frustration, anger, riots, and sometimes war. So you can see that in the case of both uh, Christianity on the one side and communism on the other side, the two religions, if you like, of the West, freedom and equality don't bed down at all.